Yep. Okay. We're set. All right. Uh, so starting again, my name is Nir. I'm the director of the um, Applied Ethics Center uh, at UMass Boston. And uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Sharifa Takin uh, with us today. Professor Takin is an assistant professor at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Uh, she works in the philosophy of science, medicine, psychiatry, and the philosophy of mind and cognitive science uh, and bioethics, and more recently on the ethics of AI. Uh, her work is informed by feminist and social epistemology, as well as first-person reports uh, of patients. And uh, Professor uh, Takin's uh, talk today is called um, Artificial Intelligence Chatbot Therapy and the future uh, of psychiatry. So uh, Tarifa, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm delighted to have you and uh, take it away. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be talking about this. Uh, I have to make a confession. I'm a very, you know, uh, involuntary AI researcher at this point. I stumbled into uh, kind of psychiatric applications of AI in the context of other work and, uh, uh, because a lot of the issues that I was perceiving felt very urgent. So I started kind of writing and thinking about these topics. So um, I will kind of take you through a, like a survey of what I have been thinking about. And I'm very excited to talk to you and learn from your expertise. So um, the kind of the timing of um, AI chatbot therapy, that kind of technology, which I'll talk about today, uh, is kind of coming at this moment of crisis in both mental health and mental health care and mental health research. On the one hand, uh, the kind of statistics of mental disorders are kind of getting worse by year, especially post-pandemic. Uh, the need and demand for clinicians who can provide uh, support for patients who are in need of um, clinical interventions is is simply not enough. So there is this kind of huge need availability gap in the mental health sphere, and tradition or kind of the forms of interventions that both researchers and clinicians were really really inter you know enthusiastic about. Uh, research kind of came to a halt. Uh, the biggest example of this is like um, psychotropic drug medication research. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, Stephen Heinemann. He's the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And he kind of talks about how pharmaceutical companies are no longer investing in developing new medications for mental disorders because, uh, you know, it kind of reached this saturation point. Either there are medications that are more or less effective for like some patients, but they have side effects. And there's just simply not enough incentive for the drug companies to develop new drugs. Uh, so it kind of came to a halt. He calls it revolution coming to a halt. On the other hand, uh, with the pandemic, there was a spike in especially uh, anxiety and depression amongst youth uh, due to various pandemic related stressors from, you know, being stuck in the house to unemployment for of parents and so on and so forth. So and it was at this time there was this enthusiasm about artificial intelligence and its applications in psychotherapy. Uh, and people like uh, Thomas Insel, uh, as a historian, you know, as a philosopher of science who is very interested in history of kind of psychiatric research, I find this very kind of interesting. Uh, Thomas Insel is a very interesting figure here. He spent his career as a neuroscientist and he pushed for kind of making neuroscientific targets as primary research targets in psychiatric research. But in the middle of all of kind of this uh, new innovations in the National Institute of Mental Health's like, research priorities. He left the organization and started working for Google Health, and he started talking about how neuroscience and other sciences have disappointed us, but AI, artificial intelligence, will give us the tools to help and intervene on mental disorders at a timely basis, and it will fill the need availability gap. And he's not alone. There's a lot of enthusiasm out there. So um, what I kind of, you know, when I stumbled upon to this, this was like the kind of, this is back in 2018, 19, prior to the pandemic, um, there was very preliminary work on the use of uh, artificial intelligence on treatments of mental disorders. And the biggest argument, and these arguments actually have remained the same, is there is a need available to gap in mental health care. There are more people people who need help than you know people who are able to support them. Um, so this their lack 
of available services to the extent that these services ex um, exist they have very high cost and you know in the context of the united states insurances like medicaid or medicare simply do not have enough funding for mental health care especially uh, also there is um high stigma of getting help or having mental disorders and getting seeking help due to that uh, and, you know, people who are vulnerable, members of vulnerable populations, such as children, have higher risk of not getting help. And kind of AI psychotherapy chatbots are purported to kind of fill this gap and address these problems. So today I will talk a little bit about the kind of technical issues, uh, um, technical properties of AI psychotherapy chatbots. It's constantly changing and evolving. So I will start with the pre-chat GPT era and then kind of bring it like to, to current what's going on right now. Um, and I will kind of point out some preliminary ethical issues that I observe even in the generation of these apps or they are being pitched as the next big revolution in psychiatry. And then I will come to kind of current research. And recently FDA have um, given one of these apps uh, a breakthrough device designation, which is a huge commitment and kind of vote of confidence from the FDA. And I will kind of dig a little bit deeper into whether or not that decision was right, which I don't think it was. And then we'll uh, end with some concluding remarks. So AI psychotherapy chatbots basically bring the kind of conceptual theoretical framework of mental disorder treatment that emerges from cognitive behavior therapy and uses like some uh, kind of contemporary technology, which can be called as digital phenotyping to kind of create these apps uh, who act like they are therapists. So, uh, I mean, you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the cognitive behavior therapy. This is kind of one of the most uh, touted, one of the most uh, evidence-based forms of therapeutic interventions out there. Um, uh, it's developed by uh, Aaron Beck back in 1970s, uh, and it's kind of one of the more, one of the most evidence-based uh, treatments that have shown some effectiveness. Though this is not really uncontested, there is more recent work uh, that points out actually, you know, CBT, uh, the fact that you know, the idea that CBT is evidence-based is actually not that true, but we can kind of grant that for now. And the basic kind of theoretical assumption is that people feel not because of the events that they encounter, but the way they think about the events. And there is this tight connection between our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. And if the therapist through cognitive behavioral therapy is able to intervene on any of these things and they can change. So usually um, the patient is encouraged to reframe their thoughts kind of think about things in more resourceful and kind of, you know, forward looking and open ended way rather than feeling like I will never be able to quit smoking, but like, oh, I haven't sm quit smoking yet, but I will do and so on. So and this kind of like one on one interaction with the between the clinician and patient uh, is supposed to educate the patient so that, at, you know, at some point the individual can start, you know, catching their implicit, but catching their biases or the, the way that they are reasoning or the fallacies in their reasoning before without even the clinician. So that's kind of the basic idea. And digital phenotyping basically uh, kind of refers to the process of inferring mental states and behavior from our digital data through through uh, from digital data through digital technologies. So phenotypes, you know, means like our, you know, characteristic attributes and um, kind of how we are, like our features. And the idea is if we use these various digital tools, we can infer where we are mentally speaking. So digital phenotyping kind of ideally uh, uses two forms of data. So one is passive data, the other one is active data. Passive data is you know, how our devices track us without us really being actively engaged. So, I mean, um, like if I'm, you know, if I'm using, using my phone, I might be speaking at a certain speed uh, or, you know, without really tracking myself, like you can kind of, you know, figure out if I'm at work or not and like looking at basically my digital footprint. There's also the active data component where in this one, uh, users actively provide input in as to, you know, what they're doing, how they're feeling and so on and so forth. 
So an AI chatbots are basically primarily using um, active data, but we'll come to that in a second. So um, Thomas Insel, you know, the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, thinks, for instance, people like him think that um, this digital phenotyping technology is super revolutionary. So, uh, you know, he talks about how we might be able to detect something like depression without even the patient or the individual is realizing that they might be getting depressed by just looking at their digital footprint. You know, if you look at their phone, they might be talking to fewer people, he says. They might be speaking slowly or returning fewer calls and spending more time at home, going to fewer places, and their sleep patterns might be, you know, um, not good. And these are all indications of, like, declining of mental health. And um, I find this statement very uh, kind of interesting. He says, putting sensor data, uh, speech and voice data, and human-computer interaction together might provide a digital phenotype that could do for psychiatry what serum cholesterol has done for other areas of medicine, giving precision to diagnosis and accuracy to outcomes. So, and he he basically wrote this article back in 2017, and I think increasingly he's becoming more optimistic as we see in his uh, most recent book. But I, I think the comparison is very significant here. He really considers this technology as, revolu as revolutionary as uh, discovering serum uh, cholesterol levels. So the early applications of this kind of technology in the context of mental health can be found in these apps called like uh, such as Wobot. Wobot, Wobot, Wobot was developed by um, uh, some a startup company that is based in Silicon Valley. So I'm gonna I'm emphasizing this because this research is not or this app is not generated or initiated by researchers at research institutions. They're basically independent developers trying to develop apps. And of course, psychologists are involved, but um, the kind of primary incentive is like profit making. The initial kind of um, iteration of this app, um, I actually kind of, when it first came out back in 2017, I tried it uh, to see how it works. These are basically screenshots from like what I tried. So this little uh, cute, cute looking guy appears and he, you know, and, and it kind of interacts with you and you're basically, prompted to type in your answers, but you don't actually even have to type in the answers. Sometimes it just gives you the standard answers that, that you can click onto, right? So here it's trying to educate first about, you know, how this app is using cognitive behavior therapy. And if you, you know, if you wanted to learn more about cognitive behavior therapy, what is CBT, you can go to a link that shows you like that's it's work that's proven by science that's an effective form of treatment and it takes you to an article that you can learn about cognitive behavior therapy. And then it's, you know, Wobot is also has a sense of humor. Uh, it kind of prompts, it kind of gave this, you know, gave me this prompt, do you want to ask this question? And that question was no childhood stuff. So there's this kind of, you know, cute way of engaging with a more kind of Freudian psychoanalytic way of uh, providing psychotherapy. And it says, sorry, you'll have to go to a human therapist's office for that. Uh, we don't have any tweed jackets, pipes, Austrian accents, and so on and so forth, right? And we're not going to talk too much about what happened in the past. What does it talk about is not much. You're supposed to basically it kind of sends you alerts throughout the day. How are you feeling? And you, you know, if you, you can kind of type into like a, you know, face, face, that's a sad face or happy face or whatever. And it says things like, have you tried going for a walk? It's very kind of preliminary, but the idea is the more you, the user types in and engages with the app, then it will learn. And with the chat GPT technology, it's a little bit more advanced now because um, they are now using large language models, training those large language models, which with actual therapist patient conversations. So after a while, the more you type in, the more kind of responsive it gets. But um, these apps, the ones that are kind of clinically approved now to be used, are still not as sophisticated as even the kind of chat GPT conversations that you might have tried. And the initial kind of evidence base, so uh, there is a lot of emphasis, like there's a lot of science talk. This is scientific, this is evidence based. But when you actually dig deeper and look at the studies that they conducted, like the first study was a 
study for um, that was done on first year freshmen at Stanford. And it wasn't even, a, you know, students with mental health problems. It was just kind of this general, are you stressed out about school and let's use this app and see if, if it will help that type of research. So it wasn't quite, um, you know, and it was a very small sample size. So, but it was a randomized control trial and they found that uh, interacting with Bobot was kind of helpful in engaging with some symptoms of depression and anxiety. Uh, and there is a lot of like kind of promise of this these apps that you see in the space, especially on the website of these uh, like apps. You know, it will help you track your mood, give you insight. Like you can kind of see how you're doing over time. It will help you feel better. It will always be there for you. This is one of the biggest selling points. Uh, you can't see your therapist every week or every month or you know or every day, but this therapist is always there. And um, in the kind of initial version, they were talking about how you won't even be stigmatized. You can kind of do this in your the privacy of your own home. So nobody will know that you're experiencing mental health problems, which I think actually perpetuates stigma rather than eliminates stigma. Because I, in an ideal world, to reduce stigma around mental disorders, we should be talking about our experiences more openly so that there is kind of less stigma. But these are the biggest kind of selling points. So this was all prior to the pandemic. And initially, I mean, it was really challenging to do kind of an even like, you know, ethical ethics or research work in this space is that there are so many apps and it's not clear what, you know, some of them are framed as wellness apps, like for you to just get better. And some of them are full on treatment for mental disorder kind of apps. And there's not a lot of research that shows that those two groups actually might be quite different. FDA's initial response to these apps during the pandemic was to relax the guidelines in their promotion and sale and like the kind of clinical trials that are being conducted because they, you know, said something like, well, you know, it might help, you know, relieve the burden of mental disorders or mental stress during the pandemic. So they loosened the criteria. Um, in, again, 2018, um, the kind of, you know, the first form of these apps, uh, they started promoting them as uh, extremely helpful tools, especially for vulnerable populations, including refugees in the war zone. So this was the peak of the Syrian refugee crisis. We were hearing a lot about what was happening and people were experiencing a lot of hardship in, and a lot of Syrian uh, refugees were in Turkey and Lebanon. And um, there was this app, again, developed by another Silicon uh, Valley company. They developed this app called Karim. Karim is an Arabic name. Uh, and the biggest selling point was, well, we cannot t send mental health care providers to the war zones uh, in the amounts that in the numbers and the quantities that we we can't we want they don't speak the language how about we send them you know this kind of be allowed we let them use these apps and maybe that will help provide support to refugees um and the biggest kind of you know selling point again is like that Karim was able to speak Arabic so that they you know it can speak the language of the people who might need uh, psychological support and again uh, in one of the kind of news articles about this uh the kind of developers said something like AI counselors need no plane tickets food protection or salaries they can easily handle case loads in the tens of thousands they can be available at any time via text message to anyone with a mobile phone so that was the selling point. Usually that like, these kind of like, it's cheap, it's available. Like it's it really feels like there's a lot of kind of marketing related incentives going on. And this is how I got into this research because I read this article and uh, I'm from Turkey and uh, this is my sister. She's an infectious disease professor. And at the time, uh, she, because she was in, she, she, you know, she does infectious diseases. Uh, she was kind of doing rounds in the, uh, in the border helping people or kind of doing the infection control of those um, uh, refugee camps. And I tagged along a couple of times when I was in Turkey and I was able to see, you know, the, you know, direct eyes, what it is like to actually spend your life or days in a uh, refugee camp. And I was really angry that, you know, there was even the thought of this kind of sending this app uh, to the war zone, and I find that I found it a lot like really dehumanizing human pain and suffering. Not to mention how it will or it will not be effective. 
So in fact, they did, uh, I'm just gonna actually go to my previous slide quickly. They did um, do a, like a prelim preliminary kind of interview with uh, some children and a, t and a teacher uh, who they gave these apps to. And it's this is very interesting, and there are lots of kind of like I think cultural cross cultural issues there too. First of all, um, the kids did not understand initially that they were not interacting with a person. Like they assumed that there was somebody from the other side on the other side that they were interacting with, and the, their the teacher who used it was you know kind of telling things like you know you know, he would report, like, I lost my family, I'm here in the refugee camp in Lebanon, and so on. And the app would say things like, you know, focus on now, and like, give these kinds of examples. And it wasn't clear how actually these people kind of perceived this. So um, some of you might be familiar with this concept. So I think what's happening, you know, if you're trying to use this kind of app, you know, you know even if let's say, let's just kind of you know, drop the skepticism for a bit, even if we think that it might be helpful. Um, there's, I think, a lot of kind of cross -cult, you know, cr cultural assumptions about what it is to have mental illness and what it is to kind of seek for help for mental illness that is getting lost in translation. So um, one of my favorite anthropologists is Joseph Heinrich, and you might know uh, this, this his work on uh, weird countries. Weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Uh, countries. And basically, um, he conducted this kind of, you know, longitudinal research that showed that a lot of the knowledge that we have in the West about human nature, what it is like to be a human and how the mind works, is actually extremely weird biased. A lot of these studies uh, in psychology and social sciences are conducted uh, and built in on experimental subjects who are, you know, mostly undergraduate uh, students in kind of affluent leading Ivy League institutions and the research results that kind of give us an idea about what it is to have normal cognition are actually not kind of the the norm and the kind of uh, in the, in, in the, from the perspective of the world rather it's very weird specific so um and he kind of comes up with these like four characteristics of uh you know weird people uh, as in kind of us right uh we are we tend to be more individualistic self-obsessed, like there's a lot of focus on kind of, you know, bettering our lives, our psychologies and so on and so forth. There is this sense that we can really, like a very strong sense of autonomy that we can really control our environment and our, you know, draw, you know, chase our destiny and very tend to be very, very analytical. But turns out these kinds of features of, you know, human beings or human mind are not universal and rather peculiar. So I think even in the kind of suggestion that these kinds of apps will provide relief for people in the kind of war zones is, you know, rife with these kinds of assumptions. So there is this idea that like I can fixate on myself to, to develop a better response to my experience as a refugee. So you can use an app to kind of make yourself like feel better. So, I mean, the kind of first problem here, again, like I grew up in Turkey, I'm Turkish. So I, you know, like I kind of find myself in this like weird transitionary place. I'm part of parts of me are really weird, and parts of me are still very Middle Eastern. I have a hard time imagining, um, you know, people in the Middle East being very open about their mental health struggles or kind of interacting with this like you know weird thing on their phone to kind of feel better about themselves. Um, and, you know, and this kind of like high heightens my worries about medicalizing kind of more social and political problems. Again, there is this idea that people want to kind of control their destiny. They want to change how they feel um, and like, you know, type into these apps. But again, if you kind of look closely at some of those cultures, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it doesn't really quite fit in with the Middle Eastern culture. There's a lot of like leaving things to fate and God and sense of like kind of, you know, there's not really much that you can do. So again, um, there is this kind of, you know, like even that, uh, the, what Kareem said to the teacher, like focus on now. And that also involves that you can really kind of, you know, put your analytical reasoning skills to address your problems and so on. And most, like the worst is there is this kind of idea, I mean, it's getting lost that this is not a person, this is not a clinician, 
and they are not actually providing care. This is just a chat bot that is giving automated, more or less automated responses. And if you look at actual psychiatric research or psychiatric ethics research, there has been a lot of work done on what kind of qualities a clinician must possess to provide the best care for their patient, right? I mean, we know from Jennifer's work, uh, you know, the book that, you know, she and uh, John wrote together, Virtue Psychiatrist, is all about, like, what can we do to become better psychiatrists to better to provide better care? And we are talking about these apps that are not even trained and they're not even, like, sophisticated as language models. So there is this kind of, we like, you know, attempt to um, apply these weird standards to communicating and treating mental health struggles of, you know, different cultures using these apps. Also, there is a huge confusion, I think, uh, of uh, language and communication. Just because the, uh, the, the app speaks Arabic does not actually make it a good communicator. And in fact, in a lot of clinical settings, as we know, a lot of things actually happen in silence, in postures. And like, so there is just simply, and you don't have to speak the same language sometimes. And again, I'm thinking about a paper that Jennifer has um, on how to kind of create therapeutic alliance with like an immigrant population if you're not speaking the same language or don't have the same culture, just kind of being present there is extremely important. So none of that is somehow in these like in these pictures. So I initially kind of underestimated when all of these this was happening. I didn't I didn't think that this would be a big deal. I in fact um you know struggle I'm like should I really write this paper like should I really say the op no, because I you know all of these issues seem quite obvious to me but then um uh, the kind of research like took off and there's also I think kind of from a you know more you know historical standpoint psychiatry has this tradition you know psychiatry gets really excited about the most recent colorful thing and then they do it and then horrible things happen and then they stop but then instead of kind of learning from that mistake, they just jump onto the other thing, right? We had, we've seen these in the lobotomies. We've seen this in the kind of an ex extreme enthusiasm about the medical model and neuroscientific research. And now I think like, you know, AI therapy, like can be really the kind of most, um, you know, recent kind of example of this. So Things got worse. I mean, I, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, I'm a very involuntary AI researcher, though these days I feel very passionate about this. Uh, I did not, I was wrong to underestimate it. It got really big. Uh, everybody got really excited about it. And a lot of kind of shortcuts were being made. Most recently, uh, the FDA uh, gave one of these apps, the WISA app, a breakthrough device designation. This is significant. So what is a um, breakthrough device designation status? So basically, breakthrough device designation is kind of this framework is designed for medical uh, devices that provide in codes, this is all from the FDA website, effective treatment and diagnosis of life-threatening or debilitating diseases. So, uh, and in this case, this app is considered a device. And the goal is to enable timely access to these devices by speeding up their development, assessment, and review, as well as marketing authorization to protect and promote public health. So here the FDA lists kind of the market financial goals uh, on the same, like at the same level as promoting public health. But I think there are potentially a lot of conflicts between, between them because in giving market authorization to an app, you're trying to make you know, help the company who developed the app sell more, but it might actually be happening at the risk of uh, public health. And offers of manufacturers an opportunity to interact with the FDA's experts and it can help manufacturers receive feedback. And most importantly, it's an official kind of way of allowing more clinical trials on using these kinds of devices, you know, you know providing funding for that, right? So, and Visa app, so this happened last June. So, and I was like, I, I was shocked when I saw this. I was very interested in seeing what the evidence base looked like. So this Visa app is actually quite popular in the UK. Uh, the National Health Services is um, a big fan of kind of using this app. So it's an AI-based digital mental health conversational agent that delivers cognitive behavior therapy. And there was one clinical trial um, that was conducted 
to see whether the using this app as a treatment therapy tool would be effective for managing chronic pain and associated depression and anxiety amongst patients who have musculoskeletal diseases. And that was the clinical trial. So prior to this, let's just kind of take a step back. So in the context of breakthrough devices, FDA regulators actually have to make a prediction about whether this experimental this device will be effective and relatively safe when used by typical patients. I mean, just remember during the pandemic how we all waited for the vaccination vaccines to go on various clinical trials so that, you know, we didn't receive them until their safety and, you know, effectiveness was kind of more on more solid grounds. So they're actually, the FDA is in a tough position here. So if they reject an experimental device when it has, in fact, a benefit, you know, favorable benefit profile, um, then they will have denied a valuable intervention. Conversely, if they approve it and the uh, device um, has a harm profile, then resources will have been wasted and there will be, you know, potential harms for patients. So, and they usually are pretty good at this kind of risk calculation. They, you know, turn down a lot of requests, but in the context of WISA, I don't think that they manage this um, risk calculus well, in that I don't think that the, that one clinical trial gave us sufficient data, sufficient data to make any reliable inference, of, inference about the safety and effectiveness of these uh, apps in treating mental disorders. So this is what the study is. Actually, you can look this up. So uh, it basically, um, the target group where, you know, the group that was given the WISA intervention was a group of patients who were diagnosed with chronic musculoskeletal pain, uh, which is defined as pain that lasts longer than three months, and then aggravated that that pain has led them or aggravated their existing anxiety and depression, right? So that's the group that they wanted, they gave the WISA app. And it was not a randomized clinical trial. Um, it was a retrospective cohort study. So basically what this means is that they gave Vice, the WISA app to a group of orthopedic patients uh, with uh, who had depression and anxiety. And then um, to compare the results of how WISA app was effective in treating their depression and anxiety, they compared it with existing data. So they did not actually just do new research on a, like a different group. They looked at a convenient sample of cohort patients who received orthopedic care without an, any kind of mental health intervention. And the third group was, uh, they had a cohort of patients who received in-person care with a psychologist as part of their orthopedic, or orthopedic treatment plan. And based on this study, uh, they have seen some clinically meaningful improvements in the two month follow up and clinical meaningful here here minus here refers to basic reduction of some symptoms of anxiety in the WISA patients. Um, and the, those changes were greater than uh, the groups B and C. So this is actually, I think, a great case study in like a philosophy of science class because it shows us how, you know, the research actually was not quite good. So it's, it has a lot of limitations. And actually, this like, article is very clear and kind of forthcoming about these limitations. One is it's retrospective design in that we don't find, you know, clinically similar three different groups and providing, giving them different treatments and then measuring outcomes. Rather, we have one experimental group and the two other group uh, we look at the existing data. So, you know, if somebody might say, well, maybe there was a healthy participation bias in that maybe the WISA group was more healthy to begin with in terms of depression and anxiety. And also, um, you know, this is a good kind of example of publication bias. This is one positive trial that showed some improvement, but we don't know if there were any other trials that has not given us the kind of evidence that maybe FDA or the company, the developer is looking for. And also like my other kind of problem with this um, study is that, well, th this app was kind of designed to address, or this particular treatment was given to people with musculoskeletal diseases who have depression and anxiety. 
Um, and I think it would be interesting to like think about whether or not this app actually would help with you know teenagers with anxiety or people who are at risk of suicide and people with eating disorders and so on and so forth. And I give these examples because in the aftermath of the FDA's decision, a number of clinical trial study uh, started that uses the WISA app to uh, kind of provide treatment to eating disorders, depression and so on, especially amongst the youth. And that's the other selling point. There is this idea that, well, teenagers don't wanna to talk to us, but they're always on their phone. Wouldn't it be great if we just can give them an app where they can interact with the phones so that you know they're um, like more willing to have therapy? So, and then these are the existing clinical trials. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can look at what kinds of clinical trials happening. And of course, we don't have these re the results yet. So these have started. And But the studies are kind of quite wide in their scope. Depression, um, suicide prevention, eating disorders, and so on and so forth. So I'm currently working on a paper that I just finished with a co-author and kind of thinking about like why they have not considered like potential risks and harms of these interventions, right? I mean, there are kind of multiple examples that come to my mind. You know, a teenager using this app might think that this is what therapy is actually like. And, you know, seeing that it doesn't work, they may just give up, not receive treatment. Um, a lot of antidepressant clinical trials, we see that we, we saw this a lot of the clinical trials uh, that does um, study on antidepressants. Patients would just would be required to quit their existing mental health treatment to um, start this new therapy or new form of treatment and then end up committing suicide because there are lots of side effects of you know withdrawing from your uh, antidepressants. And some of these clinical trials, um, from, you know, to the extent that I can see that information require that patients not be on any other form of treatment while they're using these apps. And that's extremely risky because um, unless there is a mechanism to report things, it seems like, you know, individual might end up harming themselves again uh, due to not receiving any other form of treatment. So um, I realized that this technology and enthusiasm about this technology is not going away. Uh, and, you know, we have to kind of come as I think it's, as bioethicists is our responsibility to try to kind of help steer the conversation and try to get developers and the kind of uh, funding agencies that fund these developers to be a lot more kind of, you know, proactive in making decisions about this. So, um, Human subjects research is huge, the, the ethical issues involving human subjects. And it looks like this AI therapy research is not really considering that because they don't think that, you know, apps can harm people from a physical standpoint. So there is not a lot of consideration of, you know, what kinds of harms and risks might be happening. So I think that needs to stop. So we need to kind of think about how, you know, to be more transparent about what the app, what these apps can do and cannot do. Um, and be, again, in the clinical trials, be very transparent about clinical uh, trial participants about possible risks of foregoing traditional mental health treatment while they're on, you know, using these kinds of apps as interventions. Patients must be closely monitored and sent to other resources if there are signs of distress. And I think I think these apps are getting better. In the initial versions, there wasn't even a 911 button and there was like a lot of crisis happening. So I think they are now better that they can send you to different resources if you're in distress. But it also requires a very capable kind of uh, and technologically capable agent to kind of manage all of this. Um, and this whole pitching of these apps as a replacement for a clinician uh, is extremely problematic because there's no guidance as to how an individual is supposed to use these apps. And I am more open to kind of developing technologies that will allow us to triangulate between the patient and the clinician. And I think chatbots can be used in that sense. It is true that it's extremely expensive and simply not plausible to see a clinician every week, but maybe you know these chatbots can help patients track certain things so that they can communicate better with the clinician and some, some something like that. And um, 
it's extremely risky to patient, I think, for patients in these clinical trials to be encouraged to, uh, you know, not seek any other mental health kind of uh, treatment while they're on their studies. And again, I think it's very important that these studies first focus on patients with mild symptoms and then kind of gradually advance, if at all. Um, and I think that and this is like my biggest problem with these apps. I think they should we should stop calling them and developers should stop calling them therapists because they are not, they are not agents. They are not people. Uh, they do not have training. There are no safeguards. I mean, if you're a researcher or clinician, if you commit some kind of a mistake, if you make a mistake, there are consequences, but we don't really have that kind of, you know, expectation or agency from this chatbot simply. So they should just be kind of referred to as like, you know, little tools of, uh, certain things. And we need to consider various research biases and think about the financial interests that are driving a lot of the development of these cap, uh, these um, apps. And especially, I think, given that these apps are being pitched as a way to bridge or address health disparities, I think it's really important for them, for us to realize that they might actually exasperate disparities. I can easily see like in um, in several school boards in LA in very poor neighborhoods have started recommending these apps to parents to help children their children with their mental health problems. I can easily see this like double tier scenario where the rich kids go get actual psychotherapy and poor kids are only given these apps. So I think we might further exasperate the health disparities. Uh, that we are trying to fix. And also, as we know now, there are lots of uh, various kind of algorithm biases and different kinds of biases in large language models in, like, that use AI technologies. And I think they can, there's a high risk of transferring those kinds of errors in this. If I have a very unpopular opinion about this. I think we should really slow down the enthusiasm and the hype about AI and how it's going to address all of medicine's problems. I mean, I see this even at my current hospital. Uh, there is a lot of excitement about what AI will help us do from, you know, um, helping reduce clinicians' workload to helping patients feel more validated to et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that we are quite there yet. And I don't know if we actually will ever be there yet, uh, there even, you know, especially in the context of like psychotherapy. So I always tell my students, you know, whenever you see this like shiny big new solution that will fix all the problems, uh, there's usually a financial interest behind it. Following the money is extremely important. Um, it's important to not, to, you know, impose our own values, especially when it comes to mental health and mental health care to, you know, different cultures around the world. And I think, um, Again, historically, bioethics always tried to catch up with medicine or bioethics had been always an afterthought after horrible things happened. And I think this is, you know, given the history, I think we should be a lot more cautious and careful about trying to move the science right along the, alongside with ethics. And I think we need more interdisciplinary collaborations between scientists, professionals, humanities, scholars, and developers or engineers who are developing those technologies. A lot of the engineers that I talk to like have no idea about, you know, they're just trying to kind of minimize some error or maximize some other thing, which of course allows them to develop these like highly technical robust tools, but it's losing sight of how those tools will interact with the real world, real environment and humans. And thank you so much. I hope I did not go super long. That was great. Thank you so much, Sharifet. Let's uh, um, let's open this up to uh, questions, colleagues. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa, please. First of all, just thank you so much. Fabulous, fabulous presentation. Um, a couple years ago, um, our lab published a couple articles on digital phenotyping. Um, and looking at the human rights implications. So I was really glad to hear you talking about, you know, uh, the, the need for caution. Um, one of my concerns, and I wondered if you could speak to this because I haven't followed up on more recent research is that um, using digital phenotyping, there's a gap between the theory and the empirical evidence to support it. And even though what I'm gonna suggest sounds 
outrageous and implausible, it could happen. If, if you're using scrolling other sorts of surrogate measures to assess depression or anxiety, et cetera, one could imagine having first responders break into someone's room because their profile looks like they're highly suicidal. Um, could you just speak to that potential concern and... Yeah. No, exactly. I, yeah, thank you so much for bringing this up. This is great. And this is this was my first thought uh, when the pandemic started about like the incels statement, right? How like, you know, not leaving their house might indicate that you might have mental illness. And like, he had no idea. We all had to be in our houses and there's a high risk of like false positives, right? And when I talk to like some like serious data scientists, like they talk about how like, there's, there can be a lot of noise in data that does not really yield any kind of inform and any information about the patient. I mean, even just the idea of like, oh, somebody not responding to their texts, therefore they must not be well. Maybe they just don't want to. Maybe they decided not to be online anymore. And like, you know, those alerts become just really annoying after a while. And now we have all these technologies to prevent those alerts from happening. No, absolutely. And I think that's, that's precisely why this is... Um, I understand the excitement, like it does satisfy me when I'm running or tracking my swimming on my phone that it gives me some information about my performance. So I think digital phenotyping, you know, maybe like makes sense in certain contexts, but I there's a high risk of false positives. And especially now that Lisa, you might know about this, there are these, um, what are they called? Uh, these environments, so in nursing homes, they started um, creating these technologies where they install cameras uh, or like in people's houses um, to detect if somebody, if a, if a senior person falls and all the system gets alerted. So like ER, go, you know, all the, you know, 911 gets alerted and so on. It's, you know, it can be anything. And a lot of the caregivers who are providing care, like the, you know, nurses and other care staff might not be really comfortable with, you know, someone barging in and that kind of stuff. So it, you know, not only it may not be scientifically or clinically useful because it's noisy, but also it comes with a lot of different kinds of privacy violation reasons. Or, you know, if as a family, uh, you may you may not be want to be watched by people as you're you know treating or dealing with your elderly and so on. So you know that's just kind of seems um, it just I mean I'm I'm very I'm I'm a doomer <laughs> like I'm very pessimistic about how exactly what you know I don't I I fail to see how it's valuable for the patient uh, without being super valuable like for profit making reasons. Thank you very much. Just one real quick question. Um, when you look at the uh, trial data on clinicaltrials.gov, were you going to look at and see if they swapped out outcome measures, for example, to try to get more positive results? So that's a good question. What's really frustrating is you can't really find a lot of details about these studies. Uh, in clinicaltrials.com, what I got my um the one of my uh, RAs is she made a list of what patients because I what I wanted to see is the clinical consent forms for instance whether you know what the patients are being told are they being told that there are risks last year I gave a talk at the Office of Human Subjects Research Conference and uh one of and the topic was AI. And they gave us this anonymized consent form that is from an actual study uh, that involves an AI chatbot therapist. And the informed consent statement says um, there's no physical harm of the study, which I find very, you know, uh, misleading when, when we're talking about mental health. So I, I, I have to look. I haven't paid attention to the outcome measures. So it would be, I think, interesting to see that data, but it's also... Oh, my student found, you know, what patients are required. So there are a number of trials that require the clinical participants not have any other form of therapy. And that's really disturbing to me. Um, so I don't know if you read just this morning, I saw the news that a hospital uh, researcher in New York State in the psychiatric hospital led by a Columbia researcher, a patient committed suicide 
during a clinical trial and they hid the data from FDA and FDA made a statement. And I'm like, I can see this coming with the kind of AI chatbot research, but we'll see. Thank you. So. Uh, Jake and then Jay. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is a really cool talk and excuse my cat jumping all over me here. Oh, um, I love cats. That's <laughs> all good. <laughs> um, I just had a kind of question. Um, and I think it may sound critical at first, but this is actually just a question that I've been struggling with in my own research regarding this and, and regarding some other things, um, just specifically surrounding how these tools get leveraged to solve an existing need in an imperfect way. And I, I heard you kind of highlighting some ways in which this happens, um, maybe right now with chatbots or ways in which it may happen in the future, right? So this idea of like kind of a two-tiered mental health system where um, socio socioeconomically disadvantaged people are getting chatbot mm -hmm. therapy and everyone else is getting this. And, and one of the things that I struggle, and I'm sympathetic to that criticism. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I struggle with though is that, I mean, as you kind of point out, um, there is this really uh, legitimate need, this legitimate gap in services. And I start to wonder the extent to which um, having anything at all is somehow a improvement over having nothing. And obviously, that's a bit of a slippery kind of thing, mm -hmm. because then you end up committed to all of the imperfections uh, of the technology. So I guess I'm just curious, how are you kind of thinking about this balance of there may be this real mm -hmm. uh, material benefit towards releasing something that's imperfect, um, against these really system-wide concerns about what do we commit ourselves to by doing that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. In fact, um, two of my colleagues and I, like I was just writing this email, we, we were working on a paper that we want to call, is something really better than nothing? Because I think that's the question, right? Like you might say, well, great. Like you don't want to medicalize. You don't want to make everybody think that everybody is weird, whatever. But if it works, like who cares? So... I mean, it's not clear, first of all, if it works or, you know, and and you can go into, to, I mean, it's actually, we know the preliminary data shows that it's not effective. Like there's, um, you know, Gus Skorberg and uh, Phoebe Friesen pu published an article a couple of years ago about this. Uh, and, you know, but you, but then you can, have, you can have two responses of that, right? Well, maybe it's just the tools are not perfect yet. And as they get better, like this will get better. But then there's, and you know, the other criticism, well, you will never be able to get like the kind of therapeutic alliance that is needed um, for any kind of clinical development to happen, right? So, and I, I guess like, like I'm an open, like I don't want to be a doomer. Like I'd want to be open-minded about technology and what, what can help given the needs. But I guess at this point, I read too much of history of psychiatry and I thought too much about what actually helps patients, right? Like a lot of my research is based on first-person memoirs. I, mean, I actually just finished a draft of my book that will be coming out next year uh, that talks about, you know, you know, cre tries to create a new framework for thinking about um, how to develop mental health interventions that are like self-based and person-based and so on and so forth. Given that framework, I find it like this way of framing or thinking about things like still limiting. But I guess like, you know, it's an empirical question after all. Like I, I do not want to be kind of closed-minded and maybe it will help, I don't know, two of the five teenagers and that should be considered a success. But my worry, you know, just looking at the kind of history of psychiatry is now, Oh, this will suck up all the funding, you know, just like neuroscientific research sucked up all the funding, you know, pharmaceutical drug research sucked up all the funding. Now this will suck up all the funding. Uh, and then we will like, you know, you know, it will be 20 years from now and we will still have not like figured out what's going on. But I think there is, you know, maybe this kind of technology will help us highlight, augment the voices that are not typically heard in the context of psychiatry. Like, you know, maybe, but I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. So I guess like time will show us, Jake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's that's really great. I mean, I, I share your kind of like, uh, I, I want to be optimistic. I feel a little pessimistic kind of thing. Um, and like maybe one of the things that I'm kind of getting out of your response as kind of another layered concern is that, you know, insofar as these are driven by commercial demand and commercial promises of viability, you end up over promising what the tool can actually do right and so like even if there is some small segment in which it is truly effective 
Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of being oversold as something that is much more capable than it is, drawing more financial mm -hmm. attention than it really deserves and stuff like that. So I mean, that's really helpful. This is, that's great. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, Jay? Um, great talk. And um, I've done some research back in the day on cross-cultural um, psychology. I'm a sociologist. And so I was intrigued by your comments about weird, which has been a problem you know, plaguing all of psychological research. Um, if there was, I was wondering if you'd thought about what um, the adaptations for counseling should be, whether electronic or human, um, for more communitarian cultures. What, what kind, because this also seems like a digital phenotype question. One of the first mm -hmm. sets of questions maybe that a chatbot should be asking is, you know, what are your life goals? Are you highly individualistic? Are you more communitarily embedded? But how do you, uh, do you think about this in your own practice or have you pr thought about it? Mm -hmm. um, about, you know, what, what, do, what should you say to a patient when they're deeply communitarian? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I've been writing about is how, so again, like when you look at psychiatry, like, and even in philosophy of psychiatry or medicine, there is no clearly defined conception of treatment. Like, you know, sometimes people talk about treatment as in like recovery way. And sometimes treatment, like uh, the, the aim of treatment as like recovery. And then sometimes like aim of treatment is, and full recovery being, you know, mental disorder, it's completely being gone to like learning to live with that. And, um, and I have done a little bit of research that looks at kind of uh, schizophrenia outcomes uh, or, you know, long-term long uh, experiences. I mean, you're probably a lot more familiar than this than me on this, that, you know, in kind of more communitarian cultures, uh, the recovery rate from, you know, delusions and schizophrenia-like experiences is a lot higher than Western cultures. And, you know, scientists, I mean, sociologists talk about that being related directly to uh, the individual being integrated into a community as opposed to disintegrated from a community, having meaningful work, meaningful relationships, and so on and so forth. And this is a kind of a trend or this is like a, you can track this kind of uh, understanding even in the kind of in the North American context. Like I read first person accounts. And of course, like a lot of these first person accounts are written in the aftermath or, you know, once the person is feeling a lot more stable and kind of flourished in their environment, they all talk about this, how their relationships were indispensable and how, uh, you know, finding work that is meaningful to them and gave them an identity, like help them and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, our contemporary ways in which we in engage with mental disorders should really look at that very seriously and talk to the patient. I mean, I love that idea of like asking the patient, like, what are your goals? Like, what do you want? And kind of making them, one of my graduate students actually wrote a dissertation, wrote a master's thesis on kind of creating this conception of treatment in collaboration with the patient, you know, aligning it with their own goals. Uh, and I think maybe it was um, uh, in an article where there was, you know, and again, when we think about this in the context of clinic in a place like US where there are lots of immigrant families, you know, a lot of families might want to come into the therapy room or the clinician's room with their child, especially with their daughter, for instance, that they don't want them or that their wife, they would not want them to interact alone with the clinician. And that because they're very communal and, you know, they, 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 there's not, there's a lot of kind of caring about that communal interaction and so on and i haven't talked about, i haven't thought about it in the context of digital world i guess um you can think about some of these apps helping you connect to other people maybe with similar experiences again that's another uh, that's what mark zuckerberg was selling yeah. facebook for at first but uh, oh. do you do you think that in in light of your analysis that um, our modern mental health crisis is partly the result of the spread of liberal individualism, the decline of marriage, the decline of extended family? Maybe, yeah. I mean, I think I think there are two things happening. Like, I think people are increasingly lonely uh, and there are not a lot of um, positive frameworks to think about mental health. Like the only way in which you can get support for your mental health needs is to get a mental disorder diagnosis. 
This is due to DSM's monopoly over everything that's governing mental health care in the context of North America. And I think people are increasingly labeling themselves sometimes, you know, without really any real justification uh, so that they can kind of get the help and support that they need. I mean, on TikTok, you see a lot of teenagers diagnosing themselves as this having this order and that order. I'm not saying that they may not, but I think they're in search of some kind of identity and community and recognition. And that's the way, that's the language that they end up using. So, um, and, you know, I talk about this in my book quite a bit about like how, you know, this is signaling us that people need a kind of a way in which to think about their identity, their selfhood, and their maybe mental disorders so that everything is more aligned. And I see trends like this as kind of decentering further away, moving us further away from the actual solutions. Uh, I mean, the appeal is, you know, solid, right? Like in Alaska, there is a huge shortage of clinicians who provide mental health, right? But then again, I think maybe the solution is increasing digital mental health or, you know, telehealth, not replacing actual clinicians or trying to substitute them with like um, bots. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate these questions. Thank you. Uh, Sharifa, if I could ask you a question. Um, of course. Uh, so uh, about the article you're writing on the something is better than nothing assumption. Um, I just wanted to suggest a, a slight broadening uh, of the of the aperture there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, talk to people in industry, the kind of argument has uh, two floors usually. One is that something's better than nothing, and we in industry are creating something. But then the other argument that usually goes with that is that without investment and without being able to uh, present the um, product uh, as uh, something that uh, somebody would uh, want to buy, then there's no something to be better than the nothing. And so then that syllogism leads you to, for having something that's better than nothing, you have to build something that somebody else would buy. Um, and um, so that's, you know, like whenever I talk to people uh, in industry, they say that, you know, all these ethical questions are really interesting, but you have to make a product that would sell in order to get the something done that's better than the nothing. And so the thing ends up being designed for in in this context, you know, what an insurance company would pay for, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's also part of the... No, right. absolutely. That that's that's a great point, and I think that's kind of where um, like I'm, I'm really like, just this whole idea of like designing a product that sells is like a very kind of market oriented mentality. And when I think about actual scientific research, it usually emerges at like public institutions or institutions that are more or less funded by the government or you know, fun, you know that receive large funding. Uh, from government organizations. And there are lots of like checks and balances, right? Before you can even apply for a grant, you get the initial IRB approval, you sign so many papers, you form a com you know, community of group of researchers with actual good credentials. There's a move now towards kind of using, uh, you know, including community uh, or, you know, other stakeholders in that into that research process. Everything is a lot more, you know, deliberate and careful uh, and, you know, structured. And that, I think, is one of the reasons that, I mean, science is still a trustworthy, trustable institution, at least for most of us, right? But now with the industry needs and like this idea of like marketing, getting ahead of the science, then we're creating this like weird science market business entity that actually has the risk of even you know lowering our trust in science and i'm not convinced that um the developers are doing a good job of engaging with researchers who have these concerns i had a silicon valley person contact me a couple of years ago and i was curious and they are developing a new product and he was trying to convince me that their product is definitely going to be better than all of these people i'm like why are you trying to convince me but i still appreciate actually them like talking to me um but like but i don't see a kind of a systematic way in which this is like happening and 
And that's what concerns me. Like, and I would, I will be really disappointed and concerned uh, if insurance starts accepting, covering the cost of these apps. That will be like the beginning of the end. Like if you just, you know, increase the crisis of mental health even more. I mean, already I think insurance goals and insurance needs and financial interests are in the way of preventing good, solid mental health care in the United States. And I think that will be the worst. And and I think FDA's you know approval of this device as a breakthrough device designation is just the first step for that. So I guess, I don't know, I need to talk to, I, I don't have, I don't trust the, the developers yet. And I think that's something that they need to do to convince us both as a public and as like researchers that they're actually doing this right. I th yeah, I think, I mean, I think the part of what's happening is that the business models they're emulating are the business models of like disease management applications, like diabetes management and stuff like that, which insurance companies probably do have a good reason for buying and paying for. And so they're kind of copying that model as something that could make money, but it's a different subject matter. Yeah. Um, Alec, please. So awesome talk um, raises lots of important questions. Um, and I'm thinking about, so I'm not a, not a psychiatrist, I'm a philosopher, um, but I'm, I'm thinking about, um, this in relation to sort of relational questions and questions of recognition. And this you touched upon a little bit in your talk, but in the context of education, I'm thinking about the potential rise of, you know, chat bot professors as alternatives. Um, of course, there's the sort of compendium model where, you know, this chat bot can be something that assists you throughout the course of a semester. Um, and that's quite different. But I, th I think maybe where the analogy is between teaching and, and therapy, and this is what I want to know more about, mm -hmm. is what is the what do we know about the importance of the sort of relational and recognitional aspects of therapy? Because there is a sort of growing trend of talking about at least relational pedagogy and thinking about the sort of the the critical importance of building relationships and the recognition between teacher and student. And so mm -hmm. ultimately, I think some of this comes down to the question of if we need that, then it is not possible for chatbots to do what is po made possible. So what do we know about um, the sort of relational aspect of therapy um, and what can that tell us? Oh, like this is a great question. Um, and I think a lot about this and this is kind of what I noticed. So like, so, like therapy, like was not really fully, has not been fully researched, especially in the last 20 years or so, because again, um, research priorities determine funding priorities, and those research priorities were mostly in neuroscience, and that led to undermining doing research on psychotherapy, phenomena like therapeutic alliance, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, when the National Institute of Mental Health developed this new paradigm for studying mental disorders, it's called RDOC, it's a very kind of biological based of understanding mental functioning and a lot of you know funding the national institute of mental health has gone to support that kind of research we had a guest uh at the at one of the meetings of the association for the advancement and philosophy and psychiatry that jennifer and i are uh, members of and the speaker the 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 person who's behind the r doc basically was asked if you wanted to do research on like homelessness and psychotherapy and like a drug use, we can't get funding from the NIMH. The person literally said, no, you can if you also get their brain scans or, you know, get their blood work done. Right. So what's really kind of interesting and shocking happening here is that like with the, with the rise of AI psychotherapy chatbots, suddenly therapy is like considered like this super effective tool. I'm like, wait a second, you were really skeptical of psychotherapy and you underfunded that research for many years. And now suddenly like therapy has a comeback. So that's my like kind of skeptical, like angry, like observation, but on a kind of more positive constructive side, uh, one of my favorite researchers um, who did a lot of work on psychotherapy is Scott Lidenfeld, and I think he died too young and he just kind of died a couple of years ago. So he's written a lot of um, 
work on like how do we do research how do we conduct research on like whether psychotherapy is helpful can we talk about contexts in which psychotherapy is actually harmful not helpful and what that what does that might look like so i think that might be a good place to kind of look uh but also i think um what we really don't have a quite good understanding or grip yet is like that how does talking and interacting with this person feeling like you're being recognized and acknowledged has an impact on your development because i think you know if you might be able to get something like that even in the context of like a like a chatbot if you have enough reasons to believe that the chatbot actually cares about you and i think maybe these wisa users who had musculoskeletal pain had some kind of that kind of you know effect like who knows but i think I mean, maybe this AI therapy chatbot will kind of divert some funding to think more carefully about how that relational aspect of therapy like might or might not work. But that's a really, really important question. And yeah. like, and I think that's like what that's the kind of theme that comes that comes up, not just in the context of like patient therapist relationship, but that you know, people talk about like how once they found their friends and niche and community, they were better. Uh, like even, you know, after very serious mental health crises. And I think that's a very, very important kind of topic to look at. Yeah, that's great. So maybe the one potential silver lining is that there's inadvertently funds that get diverted and then we learn much more about the kind of psychotherapeutic. Yeah, that's great. Exactly, exactly. Hopefully. Uh, Sharifa, one just other thought that occurred to me in the context of sort of using these apps and non-weird contexts, one technical solution that will probably at some point be raised for that, which is both manipulative and just interesting. If you kind of imagine uh, psychotherapy uh, bots uh, 2.0 with a combination of uh, robotics and the combination of the capacity to uh, download the social media messaging of the relevant person, then our you know tendency to anthropomorphize will probably make up the difference and so then all of a sudden you have a chatbot that kind of sounds like the social media of the person that they uh, are talking to and looks a little bit like somebody that they're more used to talking to i have a sense that the kind of uh i mean that's weird enough in itself but i think the that would actually, I don't like it, but I think that that would reduce the alienation pretty significantly. Yeah, I don't know if you caught this. This was before ChatGPT3 was like actually open to public. Uh, there was like this app or like uh, some kind of like tool or website that you could log into that and talk to ChatGPT. This person created, so they lost their fiance, she died. And they went back to all the texts and interactions that they had and put them and used them to train the yep. bot, right? And then suddenly we have like this, Lisa, her name is Lisa. Her name, like, so she, he had this like Lisa bot that he was interacting with. And he ended up reaching out to Lisa's family and they're all weirded out about this. And there was this whole like, uh, you know, like, Twitter like link about like you know chain about the conversation about how this is just so weird like are we not going to be able to even you know die really like you know parts of us will continue with our writing and words like in this kind of space and it's just really kind of redefines I think what it means to be a human in the sense that like losing someone is an intrinsically you know like it's such a like a, it happens to everybody right and now we're like oh okay maybe like part of them will continue to like live in this like weird format and i find that very interesting i think that's you know scary i also don't like it but i think that it like something like that is kind of coming and i worry that phenomena like this will not appear strange to future generations as much as they do to us like i find it hard to get the idea that oh like this chatbot this is like now your therapist because you know i have interacted with clinicians i know how clinical encounter works i'm like you can't be really believing that but then you know when you're thinking about people who are born into this kind of world then it's just like 
uh, kind of losing their bizarreness and so on and so forth. But that that really, I mean, I found myself kind of thinking about that. Oh, like, what if I copied and pasted these interactions in ChatGPT, and then like, what would happen? Like, it's cur curiosity, but mm. you know, yeah, yeah, but I don't know. All right, Sharifa, I, I don't want to uh, keep you much longer. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you so much for having me. This was delightful. Very nice to meet you. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thanks okay. again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.